look now if you want. I still have a key. Good. Let's go take a look. The Dark Side of Midnight was made in 1984 by Wes Olson, who served as the film's writer, director, producer, editor, and lead actor. For his many roles, Olson's ambitions place him in a long line of filmmakers who, by maintaining complete creative control over their work, reinforce a model of lone authorship, an auteur cinema that favors the romantic image of the artist. But the concept of an auteur cinema presumes the repetition and evolution of a set of themes and styles over the course of a growing body of work. The Dark Side of Midnight would be Olsen's only film, a thriller that is both of its era and out of time, a movie defined by its homespun technique, curious pacing, and uncannily brilliant hero. The story borrows liberally from Steven Spielberg's Jaws another film in which the law must fight both an unpredictable monster and the greed of local officials. Modesto, California stands in for the fictional Fort Smith, a town on the verge of change. Plans to establish a new state university in Fort Smith seem to have turned the town's fortunes around so dramatically that city officials will do anything to ensure that the deal goes through. At the same time, a serial killer known as the Creeper has been terrorizing the town, and his crimes threaten to drive away the university. This killer is aggravating the conflict between the new and old culture of the town, a conflict typified by Mayor Riley and Chief Ned Cooper. Mayor Riley is introduced as a corrupt, self-interested incompetent, eager to gloss over the crimes to protect his own investments. And a story like that Freeman murder case could seriously hurt our chances of getting that university built here in Fort Smith. A young girl has been killed, and all that you're concerned about is a damn university? Get out of my office. You're, you're trespassing. Mayor, do you want me to call the police? You moron, I am the police. Now beat it. Chief Cooper, a crusty pillar of honesty, is at odds with the mayor. Cooper races against time to catch the Creeper, who, as the movie's theme song tells, has a pattern and only makes his strike on the dark side of midnight. The Creeper's identity is no mystery. The killer is seen early in the film, a random maniac with no connection to the people of Fort Smith. He's portrayed as a force of nature, an unmistakable boogeyman in his wide-brimmed hat and red plaid shirt. He's an outsider, an urban legend made flesh.
it's revealed that he is the Detroit Creeper, a murderer who fled capture in Motor City, only to take shelter in the attics and back seats of Fort Smith. Every one of these articles in this scrapbook are about the murders committed by the Detroit Creeper over two years ago. Hello, Ben. I just got the mayor to approve the funds to hire Brock Johnson. The plot turns in a new direction, as the chief is forced to call in outside expertise. The town enlists Brock Johnson, a famous detective whose supposed youth surprises his new colleagues. I think this might be him. Yeah, it is him. The young guy? <laughs> Didn't I tell you? He's only 29. No, he's just a kid. He's young, but he's the best. Good to see you, Mr. Fisher. Good to see you again, young fella. Played by writer-director Wes Olson, Brock Johnson is an archetypal hero from his arrival in town. In his presence, the film transforms from a routine thriller to a tribute to Johnson's unchallenged vitality and youth. Mayor Riley, people's lives are at stake. Shut up, young man. This is none of your business. The only challenge to it is not within the world of the film, but in the audience's encounter with Olsen himself. From his haircut, to his nasal voice, to his startling lack of charisma, Brock Johnson is unexceptional a condition made all the more comic by the flattery of the chief. Allow me to introduce you. This is my daughter, Jan. Jan, this is Brock Johnson. It's very nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, Jan. Such a disconnect between what the film tells us and what it shows us becomes central as Johnson pursues the chief's daughter in a sudden courtship within moments of meeting her in one of the strangest, most infernal fireside romances in all of cinema. Throughout, a friendship develops between Brock Johnson and the Chief. Chief Cooper's hot-tempered inadequacy makes him an ideal foil for Johnson, who he admires as a hero. By the Simmons house and see if they're still up. There's something I'd like to check out. Johnson's affection for Chief Cooper is, like all that he does, an effortless facet of his generous character. Mayor Riley and his cronies lay obstacles in their path, enlisting another cop, Lieutenant Ted Nilsen, to undermine their investigation. No work, and all play. <laughs> Nilsen is presented as a counterpoint to Cooper and Johnson. Ironically, it is he who is portrayed as a vain, self-deluded Lothario. Johnson's sleuthing leads into the film's final act, where the mayor receives his comeuppance, I'm ruined. Financially ruined. The town's university ambitions collapse. The Board of Regents made their decision on where they're going to build a new university. They're going to build it in Newton. Newton! <laughs> and the threat of the Creeper is eliminated by Johnson, who throws a Molotov cocktail into the killer's house. This strange act of cowardice is rationalized within the rose-colored lenses of the film, where Brock Johnson is indisputably heroic, logical, invincible, the absolute policeman. Get up. What do you want? You're under arrest. What for? Murder. 
The Dark Side of Midnight echoes the customary twists and turns of police stories. It offers the familiar archetypes of corrupt bureaucrats, traitorous lawmen, honest lawmen, outsider lawmen, traumatized victims. I don't want to talk about this anymore. The archetypes are indistinct, but the performances are not. The exaggerated expressions and affected speech of the actors is funny, but it also serves to flesh out the setting, realizing Fort Smith as an authentic Anytown USA, peopled with memorable, genial characters. While some characters are presented as villains, even they function as reminders of the civility of the protagonists, and their antagonism is nearer to that of a cartoon coyote. Cooper went for it. Good. By the time Cooper flies to Vancouver and realizes that he's been sent on a wild goose chase, he won't be able to get a flight back till later tonight. That'll be plenty of time to keep him out of the way. That's a great line. <laughs> Brock Johnson is the epitome of valor, to such a degree that the function of a hero might be questioned. Is this character, who's constantly reminded of his power over others, simply a mirror of the killer? The killer whose malice and perversion is a perfect opposite to Johnson's benevolence and respectability? Its editing is spare and utilitarian, the harsh shadows of its thrifty lighting no more unusual than those of many low-budget movies. Mayor Riley, Mac Thompson, the golf pro at your country club, is on line one. Its dialogue is wooden and unnatural. Even its comedy delivers unintentionally, as the stiff and stuttering dialogue offers smug jokes with plain overstatements. I don't play golf. Cooper, what are you doing on this line? I thought you were Mac Thompson. Or flatness of delivery. <laughs> Damn bird. Well, it scared the hell out of me. You better watch out for those pigeons, Ned. They can be pretty tough customers. I wonder where Timmy is. Its storytelling relies on the well-worn but entertaining tropes of the thriller. The Dark Side of Midnight distinguishes itself in how it handles these tropes. In spite of its dated appearance, the film was made at the height of the slasher movie craze, and it embraces the time values of that genre. For instance, to have prolonged scenes in which the killers stalk their victims, where every closet door or dark corner has a menacing potential. The Dark Side of Midnight subverts these expectations, as all slashers do, but it also suspends its victims in anticipation to a greater degree than the average slasher, making the film a little bit more unpredictable. Sometimes it offers up the creeper as a relief from tension, other times his appearance ratchets up the tension. But because of his strange costuming and his stoicism, these sudden appearances can also serve as a sight gag. Some very interesting facts on how you are trying to suppress the stories in this town concerning the murders, because they might interfere with the new university you hope to have built here. And if my nose doesn't fail me, it smells like there's a lot of graft involved on your part. You have no proof. At the moment, no. But I won't have to look very far to come up with what I need to nail your butt. What most differentiates The Dark Side of Midnight from other films of its kind is its commitment 
to the ego of its maker. This curious proposal that Brock Johnson's expertise is, like his purported youth, a fact beyond reproach. Indeed, within days of arriving in town, he solves the crimes and vanquishes the killer, but his character remains most defined by the admiring remarks of others, the absolute policeman, a perfect alien. No, it won't bother me. The fact that you're a sex fiend and a regular Don Juan, and you want to stay up all night, and the fact that my daughter wants to show you to your room, <laughs> no, it doesn't bother me. Jaws, in its portrayal of a small town facing a threat to both its citizens and its economic future, gave us a flawed protagonist who succeeds by conquering his fears and by belonging to a team of equally flawed, haunted experts. The Dark Side of Midnight offers only a fantasy of sharks, one a brutal psychopath, the other a hero of heroes. 